Dampness in Buildings and Diagnosis, Module 4 Measurement of Moisture in Wood The equilibrium moisture content of wood. It's important to appreciate that wood is a hygroscopic material. It absorbs atmospheric moisture. The level of atmospheric moisture taken up depends on the surrounding humidity. For example, at 80% relative humidity, we would expect wood to have a moisture content simply from water absorbed from the atmosphere of probably 18-19%, getting up towards 20 On the other hand, if we could maintain the wood at 45% relative humidity, we would expect an air-dry moisture content of the wood in equilibrium with the air at that relative humidity to be somewhere in the order of 10 or 11%. It should be appreciated that there is a direct relationship between the moisture content of wood and electrical resistance and capacitance as used by some of the meters. This is true with timber moisture contents up to the fibre saturation point, around 28-30%. to 30%. Up to this point, electrical moisture meters are considered suitably accurate, that is, around plus or minus 2%. Above the fibre saturation point, the accuracy disappears. Remember that above the fibre saturation point, the wood is starting to become wet and the lumen of the cells is starting to fill with water. It must also be appreciated that using a moisture meter, there is no such relationship when used on masonry substrates. Hence the term wood moisture equivalent. That is to say, 18% measured in timber is a quantitative objective figure. The same figure on a meter in or on masonry measured as wood moisture equivalent is not quantitative. However, what one must remember and appreciate as shown in earlier modules is that it's the pattern of readings if these things are going to be used on masonry that's important not the actual figure moisture meter timber scales on the left is a very old meter and it has two scales softwood and hardwood and also note that it is not calibrated for want of another word beyond 28 percent i.e it is not can calibrated beyond the fibre saturation point. How do we use a moisture meter on timber? Basically we have to measure as close as possible to the potential source of moisture. Take this skirting for example, we're using the very top of the skirting. Why? It's very close to the potential source of moisture. The feature to remember is that water does not pass very readily across the grain, hence you need to go very close to that potential source of moisture. If we look at conditions, in a normal dry living environment, we wouldn't expect to have the timber moisture content much above 16%. If it's just higher than this, it may be in contact with dampness. So, and I emphasise, as a very broad guide, 17 to 18% moisture content, it might be in contact with dampness, but unlikely to rot. 18 to 20, almost certainly in contact with dampness, although not yet a significant risk to rot. Greater than 20% in contact with dampness will be at risk to rot. However, in reality, it is greater, i.e. above the fibre saturation point, to initiate rot. However, for practical purposes, I would use the 20% figure as the critical level for rot to develop. Why? It gives 
a very good margin for error. However, as a reminder, where high relative humidities may be persistently present, namely 80% plus, and these you find in roof spaces and subfloor voids in the colder months, one may expect moisture content in excess of 20% due to the hygroscopic nature of the wood. Bear that in mind. So how can we use a moisture meter? Well, let's have a look at this simple one. It's called Follow the Trail. Imagine we're looking at a centrally heated property and the skirting is found to be 19%. What action do we take? Well, what is that suggesting? If the skirting is fixed to a wall at that moisture content, then it's likely that the wall itself is damp. However, if it is damp, the real problem is where it's damp and is it damp or even more damp lower down in the wall? Now the problem we have here is if that wall is damp, as suggested by the skirting, then we need to look at areas in the subfloor where timbers may be in contact with such dampness. And of course, if it's high enough, it may lead to rot or the wood may already be rotting. We could also use hammer electrodes for this. And that's a hammer electrode, We've got insulated pins and you can see the handle part for ramming this into, for example, a floorboard. So we could be looking at a subfloor void in the possible way. We put our moisture meter probes, we ram them in the floor and on the top of the board we get 13% say in our hypothetical example. However, by the time we've rammed those moisture meter probes through the boards, you get a much higher moisture content. Now that starts to suggest a humid subfloor, possibly even damp, so it would indicate that it does perhaps need investigation. So that's the method using a moisture meter. There is another method of course, and that is the oven dry method. And it's quite simple. Basically, one takes a piece of wood, weighs it, and then dries it in an oven at 105 degrees and weigh it periodically until the weight loss is no more than 0.1% between weighings. The reason for this is quite simply, once you start drying wood, it continues to lose weight, even tiny bit by tiny bit. So that's what we're looking for. If that weight loss between two weighings is less than 0.1%, we call that the final weight. So we then come to the calculation. That's the wet weight of wood, i.e. its original weight, minus the dry weight, and that gives us the weight of water, over the dry weight of wood, times 100, will give us the percent moisture content by weight. The next section is on the measurement of moisture in air. It's simply a very short section to cover the methodology, just outlining it, but more examples of this and how to use it properly are given in later modules. One method of looking at atmospheric moisture, i.e. measuring the relative humidity, is a whirling hygrometer. It's rather like a football rattle where we have two identical thermometers. The top one is known as a dry bulb and the bottom one is known as a wet bulb. This has a wick around it and this wick leads into a little reservoir of water. The idea is you swing it around your head, allegedly at a lot less than two meters per second, and we get two readings. We get the air reading on the dry bulb, the room temperature reading on the dry bulb, and the principle of the wet bulb is quite simply that when evaporation takes place it cools the surface of that material and it will cool the bulb at the base of the thermometer. So we finish up with two different readings. The more humid the air, the slower the rate of evaporation, and the lower the cooling. The drier the air, 
the faster the rate of evaporation and the greater the cooling. So, as I've just mentioned, we finish up with two temperatures and a difference between the two. We can look at that difference between the two and check them on a table or a set of scales and this will give us the relative humidity. From this we can also calculate the dew point. Thermohygrometers in general, uh, the one on the left is a little handheld thermohygrometer, very good for snapshot surveys, that is a survey when you're in the property. Um, however, these handheld instruments must be allowed to come into equilibrium with the environment before taking any readings. If they're not, and you bring it in from a very cold car into a warm building, you'll get silly readings until they come down to room temperature. Most of these meters will also record the dew point temperature. The little gadgets on the right are simply little thermohygrometers which can be left in the room for the occupants to see the temperature and humidity data in real time. Finally, we have data loggers. We have data loggers, atmospheric data loggers. And these are used to sample atmospheric conditions over a period of time, e.g. four weeks plus. They can monitor for over a year, depending on the time gap. The beauty of a data logger is that in a building, the atmospheric conditions can change very rapidly during the day and during the night. Even within relatively short times, we can get rapid changes. The problem we have there is if one does a snapshot survey, which is frequently done, then half an hour later, the conditions can be totally different. So that is the beauty of data loggers. These particular data loggers, as probably many of them do, they record temperature, humidity and dew point at set specific time intervals. And these can be used to calculate other factors. With reference to moisture in the atmosphere, we'll look at this in more detail and interpretation of data in a later module. Dampness in buildings and diagnosis, end of module 4.